don't care me. Don't worry, <laughs> this isn't going to turn into a musical theater show. Although, honestly, I wouldn't be mad if it did. Um, hi, confidants. Welcome to another magical, wonderful, uh, hostful solo podcast of Confidently Insecure. You know it's the podcast. We are absolutely sure we don't know everything because we know that there are strengths and our weaknesses. And one of my weaknesses is thinking I know everything um, and then being embarrassed and finding out, in fact, that I um, am not the all-knower of the universe like a magical wizard Harry Potter as much as I wish I was. And that's why I made this podcast. Uh, You guys didn't ask for an explainer, but here it is. By the way... (laughs) No one could see that, um, or no one could hear that. You could only see it. But I'm currently, I'm currently dog sitting a very cute Australian shepherd named Walter. He's a mini Australian shepherd, so he's like tiny Chihuahua sized. Well, more like corgi sized. Anyways, him and my cat do not get along. So if you hear noises uh, or see, uh. A world war happened. That's what that is. But my cat just climbed up on my shoulder to like check out where Walter was. And Walter's currently sitting in my lap. So, um, yeah, happy uh, autumnal season. We are just uh, exiting Libra and into Scorpio season. Um, I don't have a lot of Scorpios in my life. I just realized as I like was going over the seasons with some people Um, I do have a lot of Libras in my life and a lot of Libra men. So I hope you guys are keeping your moons and stars in check and checking in with yourselves, just seeing how you're feeling. Uh, We're entering the holiday season. Yes, Halloween is one of my favorite holidays. And as we enter this season of the year, I always, like I never really thought I had seasonal depression But I think the older I get and the more in tune I am with my body and my thought process, the more I think I may have it. So just a little self-care, self-love reminder to just check in with yourself this time of year. And like, you know, I know it can feel very like coupley around Halloween, but like TBH, I always loved Halloween when I was single. That was like the night that I not only put on a costume, but it was like a fucking alter ego. And I just slutted it up more like Halloween. am I right any of you old adult shit listeners remember when we did Hovember so give yourself permission this season to just hoe it up a little bit like adopt another alter ego go out with your with your friends have fun try not to put too much pressure on yourself also Halloween is one of those holidays where it's like one fucking night right it's not like uh, the December holidays or even Thanksgiving can be drawn out to be a couple days. Like it's one freaking night. So if you're just like not in the mood, don't bother stressing yourself out. Like bitch, some of us are on budgets. Those freaking hoey ass costumes can be like $50. I don't know if people still do that, but like in high school, we would literally have to come up with like $50 out of thin ass air to buy a costume that was like hoey AF, convince our parents to give us money to dress like a slore for the night. Why were those costumes so expensive? I mean, I, I have to assume they're still expensive. I am one who has recently uh, in the last couple of years taken up like um, making homemade costumes because A, I just don't give a fuck anymore about impressing people. And B, I think now that like heavy, fun makeup and like artistry with makeup is really like um, normal. You can just show off with your makeup skills. You know, like I was a lion one year and I just teased my hair and then did dope ass face makeup. And that was me being a lion that year. (laughs) I think two or three years ago, I was a skeleton again, just wore like a black tank top and then just did hoey ass skeleton makeup. Um, This year I got a full on onesie bodysuit from that company tipsy elves, not sponsored, but Hey, shout out tipsy elves. Um, They sent me a skeleton costume. So I'm just going to be in a onesie, like a, like a spacesuit onesie skeleton. It's I'm going for comfort. Okay. (laughs) 
Jared and I are also going to be attending a swingers party next weekend. It's the first one we're going to together. Uh, and it's themed the horror, I guess. <laughs> Which, now that I say that out loud, it's like, it's not as, I mean, I guess it's supposed to be spooky, like taboo-y spooky, like where people do like BDSM, like a little more like um, uh, whips and chains this time of year. Uh, but it's all very safe still. <laughs> so we're going to be doing that next weekend. Those are like Halloween plans. And though Halloween is on a Thursday, the following week, which is also the day that the podcast come out. Yes. Um, I am releasing a episode that was supposed to go up this week, which is why you're getting a lovely solo episode this week. But I talked with a mystic. Ooh, spooky season. Ooh. But we had audio issues. And so that's why the podcast is up late because I was just like, fuck it. I'm just going to do my own episode rather than try and rush to fix those issues. I would rather like take another week and make sure it sounds nice and smooth and buttery for your ears, my dear confidants. So this week is a two-parter. This one is going to be half fan questions and half my story about being diagnosed with HPV. Hooray. Let's just dive into the HPV first because I feel like when I posted this on my Instagram story, so freaking many of you told me that you have gone through similar situations and I was actually pretty shocked to hear how many of you have actually had to have like incision type surgeries. Um, to fix your lady bit issues. And again, like, I think I made a couple of mistakes on my Instagram story and being like, ladies, get your vaginas checked. And a lot of people were like, not all ladies have vaginas and not all vaginas belong to ladies. And yes, I agree. But it was just more of like a, oh, I'm a single ladies kind of phrase. So I didn't mean it. And moving forward with this episode, I just mean people with vagines, okay, or cervixes, I should say specifically, because that's the issue I'm dealing with. So let's start from the beginning Um, about, oh, I don't know. I want to say it's probably been like two and a half years now. I stopped taking birth control. And as soon as I stopped taking oral contraceptive, I started having so many pussy problems. Like I joke about it on Twitter. Like I have a problematic pussy, but like it's no joke. It's just truth. <laughs> you guys know about my chronic yeast infection issues, but uh, this really took it up a notch with um, what I've been dealing with with the last couple of weeks. So when I stopped taking birth control, I started getting cysts that I had to deal with that were really painful. My period was kind of irregular. Um, I would like bleed during sex sometimes. Like it was just a lot more uh, issues because I think well, not I think, I know that the birth control was masking issues. And so part of me was like, oh, if I just would have kept taking birth control, then none of this would have happened. But as we hopefully all know that taking birth control for longer than a certain period of time can actually do more harm than good. And I was going on like 12 years of being on birth control. So it was time to cleanse uh, my system of that. Um and I was with Jared, like when I got off of it, I, we were just starting to get into a relationship. So as you guys know, we are in an open relation and we do have other partners and we're always safe about it. And if like not, it's because we're, we're like dating the person and we have the conversation about SEDs and testing and like, you know, making sure we're all good there and always being upfront and honest. Well, I remember being told when I was in my 20s that there was a new shot out on the market that was the HPV shot, Gardasil. And uh, any of you uh, late 20s, early 30s probably all remember this of like how hard they were pushing the Gardasil shot. And so I remember going to my gyno's office when I was like in my 20s, early 20s, maybe even like 20 years old, and her being like, hey, we have this, you should get it. And I was just like, oh, okay. It's not like a conversation. She was like, no, you should just like prevent against HPV. And back then I hadn't even heard of HPV. I didn't know what it was. She said it was like a virus. I was like herpes. She's like, no, but kinda. And I was like very confused. And she was like, trust me, 
all women your age should have the Gardasil shot. So that same office visit, she just gave me the first round of shots. And I think it was like three rounds of shots that I had to go back for. And I, again, I was so young and I, was, I did, wasn't asking a lot of questions. I didn't really know what I was even protecting myself against. I just knew that at the recommendation of her that I should get it. And I thought, okay, I got the HPV shot. I'm good. I'll never have HPV. Well, well, wellity, well, well. Uh, things aren't always what they seem here in Pussyville. Uh, hi, I'm Kelsey. You're probably wondering how I got here. It all started when my mom and my dad had me, and then I had pussy problems. My life is pretty crazy. Sorry, I've been obsessed with TikTok lately. That's why this is happening. Okay, back to the story. <laughs> so, uh, I was recently on Megan Rink's podcast, Don't Blame Me, and this was a few months ago where we did an episode where someone wrote in, her podcast is all about um, answering fan questions, that's like the whole format, and someone had written in about being diagnosed with HPV and how they were so embarrassed and ashamed and should they tell their boyfriend and yada yada, and I was talking and giving advice like I knew what the fuck I was talking about like over my 20s I've gotten like a little bit more educated about what exactly it is but I still didn't know like the whole uh education around HPV and I realized after doing that podcast and you know like in the moment I didn't want to say like oh I don't actually know the answer to this I kind of just like gave very general advice like yeah, you know, your health is important and being honest with your partner is important. Like, do you, boo? Um, and then I realized I needed to like get more knowledge about HPV. So it just so happened that I had a gyno appointment not too long after that podcast. And while I was there, I was like, hey, BT Dubs, I got a new gyno. She's amazing. Uh, her name's Dr. Varky. And I want to try and get her on the podcast once. I don't know if she does this kind of thing, but I'm just putting this out in the universe. Um, and I was like, Hey, Dr. Parks, you're so great and wonderful and support my lifestyle. What's HPV? Like, what's the deal with that? Like, I know what it is, but I just know that like everyone has it or, you know, and she was like, Ooh, girl, you really, truly have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so she explained to me that it's kind of like a cold for your pussy. And I think it's something like 80% of women will have HPV in their lifetime and it, your body will just handle it. Your body will just let it go away. Now, during that time, you can have no symptoms while having HPV. And you can also pass it to other partners without knowing you're doing it if you have no symptoms and you're not, um, even if you are using protection. So get this. The crazy thing about HPV is that it can be transferred through any sort of intimate contact. It doesn't even need to be intercourse. So you could just be like, dry hump the fuck out of each other's thighs, which I love to do, ladies, am I right? And you can pass and contract HPV from a partner. So that's the first thing you need to know is that if you are having like any intimacy, and Dr. Varky told me that she sees people who are virgins come in. I hate using the word virgin people who have not had intercourse before come in all the time and have it. And I was like, holy shit, I don't think enough people know that about HPV. I think they think it's like a dirty STD. Um, the other thing about HPV that's good to know is that there are three dangerous strains that are more dangerous than all the other hundreds of other F HPV strains. So what Gardasil was when it came out, those shots that I had were protection against the three most dangerous kinds of strains. Those are the strains that remember how I said it's like a cold for your pussy. Well, if your cold doesn't go away, it can develop into something more severe like pneumonia, right? Same with your pussy cold. It can develop into something more uh, intense, more uh, dangerous for your cells, and that can lead to cervical cancer. Now, there's another crazy statistic about cervical cancer that something like, I want to say 70%, this all could be wrong, but this is confidently into the podcast where I'm absolutely sure I don't know everything. Uh, 70%, I want to say, women who die from cervical cancer 
die because they didn't have proper access to health care. So cervical cancer is a lot more preventable and treatable now than it's ever been with things like gyno screenings, pap smears, regular visits, um, just getting women are getting more comfortable with their pussies now more than ever. So that's another good thing to know is like when something abnormal like HPV sits in your body a little bit longer, I think we're so scared because that word is so associated associated with cervical cancer that um, it can feel very scary. But most strains and most diagnoses of HPV are just colds. So you very rarely run the risks of it having developed into something deeper. Now, they say you're supposed to get your pap smears every three years, right? Well, let's just talk a little bit about pap smears because I feel like this audience can skew young a little bit and maybe you guys haven't had your first pap smear. But a pap smear is like taking a little scraping of your cervi, vaginal wall, uterine area. (laughs) I don't know which one it is actually. Uh, They they go up in your puss and they take a scrape and they test cells. That's what a pap smear is. Um, And you'll hear most of the time that your pap smears will come back normal and you should be doing them every two to three years as long as you're having normal uh, results. So I started getting pap smears as soon as I started having intercourse just because that was something my gyno was like, you should do. Um, so I should highly recommend if you're not getting pap smears, first of all, why not? If your gyno's not talking to you about that, that's a red flag. Um, some people think it hurts. It does not hurt. I, I said that and then I thought about all the women that deal with pelvic pain and like endometriosis and stuff. So I I can't say like, it doesn't hurt. But for me, it doesn't hurt me. It, it, what hurts the most is the speculum, which is like, <laughs> you know, the little cranker oper thing, the cranker of the pussy opener thing uh, that goes inside of you. That to me is always like the most uncomfortable part. And that's how I would describe a pap smear is it's uncomfortable, not painful. Um, so you get your pap smear results back. And she told me that usually you can come back with three options. So you either come back with a normal pap smear. Great. You come back every two to three years and get tested. Uh, You can come back with an abnormal pap, which is what happened to me. And then I guess the third option is like scary results, which is what happened to me. So tying this all back into when I went in to ask my doctor uh, about what HPV was when I went on Megan's podcast, she was like, oh, speaking of, like, we need to do your pap smear. So I had, I came back in another time to do another (laughs) test for my pap smear. And she said that, you know, we'll do the pap smear and we'll call you next week. So she calls me the next week and she says, you're Pap is abnormal. And I was like, oh, okay. And she's like, it's abnormal with severe results. And I was like, hmm, what does that mean? (laughs) So I started doing my own research and Googling, which if you are like me and you are a control freak and you need to know what's going on with your body can be a good thing. But if you're not someone that can differentiate horror stories and unfortunate incidences from you know, the common occurrence, don't Google these sorts of things. But I found this really great uh, PDF kit that is from the National Cancer Institute that's titled Understanding Cervical Changes, a Health Guide for Women. Women, people with cervicals, uteruses, vaginas. Um, I'm going to put that linked uh, below. So this is something you can like check out with me, uh, read along with me. Um, and I just want to go over some of what I discovered after I got the word from the nurse that I was going to have to come back in because of my abnormal pap. So it's good to know that most women who have abnormal cervical screening test results do not have cervical cancer. Most have early cell changes that can be monitored and they very often go away on their own. Again, like I said, your body, you know, vagina self-cleaning organ, your body just takes care of the flu for you. Uh, Or it can be treated early to prevent problems later on. So you need to get follow-up visits and yada, yada, yada. It's important to go to your gyno. Uh, Good news about preventing cervical cancer is we know what causes cervical cancer. Nearly all cervical cancer is caused by 
HPV, which is the human papillomavirus. Cervical cell changes can happen slowly. So it can take many years for cells infected with HPV to develop into cervical cancer. Again, so if you get an abnormal PAP result, that doesn't mean cervical cancer or necessarily anything bad because it takes years to sort of marinate into your system. Um, The better screening tests means less frequent screening. So again, like if you get an okay PAP, you don't have to come back that often. But if you do get an abnormal pap like myself, you'll, you will have to come back in more often to make sure like once you're at risk, they want to make sure you're cleared out. Um, the human papilloma virus is a group of related viruses, some of which are spread through sexual contact and can cause cancer, including cervical cancer. So here's some basic facts about HPV. Most HPV infections, even with the high risk types, which is what I have, go away on their own without causing problems. Like I said, they're fought off by the body's immune system. However, sometimes infections with high risk HPV do not go away. And in that case, uh, the cells become abnormal and they can get worse over time and become cancer. And although there is currently no way to treat an HPV infection, cervical cancer can be prevented by detecting and removing abnormal cervical cells before they become cancer. So more on that with your girl in a moment. Um, HPV infections are common. And let me stress this highly (laughs) because I had a lot of you who slid into my DMs being like, thank you for saying something and normalizing this conversation because I have HPV. I'm so embarrassed. I don't, you know, I didn't know at the time how common it was. Uh, I didn't know how to tell my partner, yada, yada, yada. But this is something that I feel like we're not regurgitating enough to sexual partners. And I feel like especially men probably don't know this and I'll get to their issue with HPV in a minute. Most people who are sexually active will have an HPV infection at some point and never know it. HPV infections can spread through skin-to-skin contact, including vaginal, anal, and oral sex. Although condoms can lower the risk of an HPV infection, they don't protect against them completely. So even condoms don't prevent HPV. So really, y'all, you can be as safe as humanly possible and still get HPV. It don't mean shit. And so that's what I mean by like STDs, STIs, the stigma around this kind of stuff. It's like, we're not recognizing that you could be a fucking nun, the safest person in the world and still have to deal with something like this. So I think we need to like, think about that when we talk about HPV. Cause I didn't even think about it when I was posting it to to Instagram. I was just like, fuck, I was told I have HPV and this is what it is. And everyone was like, Oh my God, I can't believe you're talking about this. And I was like, what do you mean? Oh, am I supposed to be embarrassed? Shit. Well, I'm not. <laughs> um, there are many types of sexually transmitted human papillomaviruses, high risk and low risk. And the low risk HPVs can cause genital warts, which I think a lot of people are more familiar with. Uh, these warts are on the external and internal sex organs and glands and genital warts do not turn into cancer. So, there's that silver lining. (laughs) High risk HPV types can infect cervical cells and cause cervical cancer. They can also infect certain other cells to cause anal cancer, penile cancer, so your dicks ain't safe either, uh, vaginal cancer, vulvar, vulvar cancer. I don't even know how to say that. It sounds like a Pokemon. And oral pharyngeal cancer, which is cancer in the middle of the throat, including the tonsils and back of the tongue, which is actually something that's being talked a lot more about ever since a celebrity came out. Um, I forget who the celebrity was, but they were basically saying like, me and my wife go down on each other. Hooray. That's how I got HPV. She got cervical cancer and I got throat cancer or it was the other way around. Anyways, point is, Uh, If you don't catch the high risk stuff, which is why it's so important to go get pap smears, it it can get ugly, but not quickly. It can just get ugly. And so think about me, y'all. Think about how much I do with my pussy and how often I'm talking about going to the gyno and yeast infections and UTIs and sex and blah, blah, blah. And still, you know, I went six months without getting a checkup and this happened. Um... So, 
Uh, let's talk a little bit about pap uh, tests and pap smears. Uh, you guys know that that's how you test for the abnormal cells is through a pap test. Um, uh, the pap test is also how you diagnose the HPV. So they can't do like the blood testing or whatever. They have to have like a swab. And uh, you can also do something called co-testing where a pap and HPV test are done at the same time. And also you want to check with your gyno when you go to get tested because sometimes they won't include HPV in a STD screening because it's so common. They only usually test if you ask for it or haven't had it in a while or are showing symptoms, which is like kind of fucked up. But if you listen to the herpes episode, you realize that this is uh, not that uncommon <laughs> in women's health care. Um, some good questions to ask before and after your exam. You can ask what's going to happen. What tests will I have and why? Will there be any discomfort? Um, I think you also can't be on your period when you do this. That's why I had to come back the second time. Uh, it's good to also know when the last time you had an HPV test or pap smear was and what those results were. So that's all good information that you should know when you're booking your appointment. Um, so the way that it worked when I went in is like your typical gyno visit where you put your legs up in those stirrups and my gyno has pink fuzzy foot stirrups because she says it like helps people relax a little bit. She also has, has really soft sweaters for you in every room in case you get cold. Like she's just really great and luxurious and I've never in my 29 years with all of my pussy problems with all of my doctor's appointments have never felt so comfortable in a doctor's office and I highly encourage all of you to try and find that same comfort when finding someone that's dealing with your bits um so they take a scrape and they send that sample of cervical cells which again your cervix is okay I'm going to explain this without having a uh, visual unless you are watching this on YouTube you have a tube that's your vagina which is you know your vaginal walls that's the actual vagina then a cervix is kind of like the middleman between your uterus and vagina so your cervix is really a narrow space, um, but really thick walls. And then it goes up into that U shape, which is the uterus and the ovaries and the fallopian tube. So your cervix is more just like the connective tissue that connects the vaginal wall and the uterus. I think without a cervix, like shit would just fall out of your pussy. That might be wrong, but <laughs> that's my um, non-medical professional opinion. Um, so once they send those samples of cells, uh, they check, um, for HPV in the lab. Um, they can also check your size, shape, and position of your uterus while you're doing these kinds of pelvic exams, as well as for like any lumps or abnormal areas. Like they should be testing all of your bits. Oh, here's the definition of what a cervix is. A cervix is a part of the female, well, we know that. It's the lower narrow end of the uterus, which leads to the vagina. Well, I already knew that. I wanted to know if stuff will just fall out of you if you didn't have one. Hmm. Anyways, um... Women that are over 30 years old or people with vaginas that are over 30 years old can get both a pap and HPV test together. This is co-testing. Uh, it means that they may only need to be screened every five years as long as their results are normal. Um, if you're 21, uh, you should get your first pap at least when you're 21, even if you're not sexually active. If you're sexually active, get it before then. But at bare minimum, if you're 21 and you haven't had a pap smear, call pause this podcast right now call or use ZocDoc which is my favorite app to use schedule an appointment and go get tested uh between 21 and 29 your average testing is every three years uh 30 to 65 is every five years and older than 65 uh at that point you're probably um talking menopausal age so uh you will no longer need screenings however if you have abnormal results, it's good to still just get tested regularly. Okay, so um, my test came back abnorms, um, and I had what was called high-grade squamous 
lesions, which is also known as moderate or severe dysplasia. It's also called CIN2, CIN23, or CIN3. H-cell means that there are more serious changes than L-cell, which is a lower grade uh, test result. Um, And it's caused by HPV and may turn into cervical cancer if not treated. So I got basically like there's four levels you can think about it. You can get uh, an ASC us which is the most common screening so that's like your green think of that as like nice easy bottom level most common uh it's usually a result of things like irritation infections yeast infections growth cysts benign non-cancerous masses um and they're not related to cancer um the next level think of like your blues like ooh, maybe a little dangerous is uh, L cell and AGC, which is atypical granular cells. I know all this sciencey stuff is not interesting, but I think just think of these levels, right? So one, two, and then uh, three, or sorry. So when you get two, when you have the abnormal cells, then you want to do a biopsy. So that's what happened to me is I came back with abnormal cells and they were like, okay, let's do a biopsy. So I went in and oh God, just thinking about it makes me a little like bleh, squeamish. They took off four segments of my cervix so think of the cervix as like a clock like a circle so they took at 12 o'clock three o'clock six o'clock and nine o'clock pieces of my cervical walls and sent them in for testing three out of four of those came back as h cell sin three which is the next level which is like let's think of it as orange like uh oh we're in the warning zone this is not good we're really close to not being healthy anymore like we are entering cervical cancer uh adenocarcinoma in situ zone which I will get to so you do the biopsy and I got the results back that it was HCL sin 3 and that means that I need to take off all those dangerous cells so that they do not turn into cervical cancer So I'm going back in November 7th to have what's called a LEAP procedure. Now, a lot of you wrote into me being like, girl, yes, I have had those. They suck. One of my friends, she's an ER nurse. She said most people go under to get it done because it's so painful. But so many gynos just do it in their offices and they can actually like localize the anesthetic in your puss and numb you in your puss so you don't feel it. And I was like, I don't want to have to deal with anesthesia. I don't want to have to do like a whole hospital thing. Like I'll just do it in my gyno's office. So November 7th, I'm getting the LEAP procedure done. Before I tell you about the LEAP procedure, I want to tell you about cervical cancer cells. So think of level four as like red dangerous, dangerous zone. Sometimes cervical cancer cells are found again, but if you're screened at, screened at regular intervals, this will really rarely happen. So it's going to be very rare that you go in, get a pap, get your abnormal cells biopsied, and they tell you you have cervical cancer. So that's the good news. I know it's really nerve wracking having to like wait for those results. Cause girl, I just did it for a week, but excuse me. Uh, it's very rare that that happens. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the LEAP procedure. And LEAP is spelled L-E-E-P, which stands for Loop Electrosurgical Excision Procedure. It is a procedure in which a thin wire loop, like it literally looks like someone bent a little wire in the shape of like a circle, Uh, has an electrical current that goes through it and it removes abnormal tissue. So it's kind of like a motherfucking mini lightsaber. Like whatever you touch with this lightsaber thing, it comes off. So they numb up your puss and they go in with this wand with this tiny little uh, wire that is a hot, hot, hot potatoes lightsaber. And they just go in and they scrape up the punan and they get all that dangerous shit out. And the way that they can see the abnormal cells is they put vinegar in your pussy. <laughs> and I guess vinegar reacts with the cells in some ways that makes them light up like a Christmas tree. So I asked my guy, I was like, is, am I going to have like a shining light coming out of my vagina? Like the holy Jesus coming out of my pussy? And she was like, no, I can only see them. And I was like, okay, thanks for the clarification. So after they see those abnormal cells, they take them out. And because it's your cervix, they can't like patch it up. So they cauterize the areas that they took off. And then you basically just have like a scab inside your punane 
and you can't have sex or do any crazy exercise for three weeks because the worst thing that can happen is, you know, you fuck that area up and you get infected or, you know, you fuck with the nerves or, you know, there are some articles, again, only Google these things if you have the strength to know the difference between freakish accidents and, and science and, and testing. But there are some incidences in where people have said leap procedures have affected their sexual functions. So good to do all your research. Uh, besides leap procedures, another three ways to get rid of abnormal cells are through laser therapy, chi- chirotherapy, which is like the freezing them off, and cold knife conization, which I I don't know what that means. I'm not even going to read into it because it sounds really scary. Um, Again, I want to remind you that I'm going to link this PDF in the bio so you can read this yourself in case you want to know more information. Now, from what I'm being told, this procedure will happen. It'll take about 40 minutes in office. And then that very same day, I can go home. So it's not going to be like you know, I got to be on bed rest, but she just said you could go into work, but you're probably going to want to take some Motrin and stay in bed all day. And I was like, great, an excuse to Netflix and chill. Send me the fuck up. After that, uh, they send all those tissues to a pathologist who is someone that checks what's called your margins. And if you've ever known anyone that has cancer, you've probably heard them talk about margins a lot. Uh, Your margins are basically like the outer edges of all the biopsies and pieces that they take out of people that have cancer to check to make sure they got all the abnormal cells. So like, If your margins aren't clear, that means they didn't get it all and they have to go back in. And my gyno said that it's very common for some women to get two to three leap procedures just because it's like deeper and longer than they originally thought. Um, And if your margins are clear, then I come back in six months. And at that point, the HPV is gone. My pussy cold is clear. And I just have to keep getting regular testing every six months until I get positive results. Well, positive meaning uh, non-abnormal results. And then I can go back to getting tested every three to five years. But all of that is to say, yeah, I get tested regularly. So the fact that this came up so quickly and got to that like orangey yikes warning level is just something to be said about like how the oven of Punan can work and do its magic slash sometimes damage. Um, I'm definitely a little nervous about the leap procedure. I made Jared come with me to the first biopsy and made him hold my hand. That really helped like having a distraction because it's not comfortable to just sit there while someone's like in your puss and you're just staring up at the ceiling. Like, why don't they put TVs up there or something? I think they should do that at dentist office choose. (sighs) Whatever. I digress. Um, okay. So that's my update. That's about as far into my research of HPV I have gotten. Now, because I know I have HPV right now, it is active and alive and thriving. When we go to the swingers party, I obviously can't participate because if I were to just like rub thighs with someone, I could transfer it. So that's another thing you need to know is if you have HPV, your sexual partner most likely does too, if they're your um, regular partner. Here's the thing about HPV in men. Men can also get the HPV shot. In the early 2010s, they were mostly marketing and targeting this towards young women, but now they even give it to men. And just because you have HPV or have had HPV in the past doesn't mean it's too late to get the shot. And it doesn't mean it's too late for men to get the shot either. So I would highly suggest all y'all motherfuckers talk to your boyfriends because they are usually, if not all, Always the carriers because they show no symptoms. <coughs> so Jared has HPV too, obviously. Sorry, Walter's licking my face and it's very cute. Can you hear him licking? I hope you can. It's very silly. Um, and so he's going to go get the shot. And because he shows no symptoms, hopefully his body will just rid of them too. But like I said, if you haven't had these HPV shots or if you haven't had a pap recently, um, this could be like a fun little thing for you and your partner to do together and call your primary care doctor. And that's what Jared's doing. He's going to get it from his primary care doctor or physician. Um, And it's never too late is the point because you still want to get immunized from those dangerous ones. 
<sighs> okay, I know that was like a lot of science coming at you fast, um, but I just want to say thank you for listening to all of that. It's been a whirlwind this last week of like research and readings and like freaking myself out and then being fine and being like, oh my God, it's no big deal. And then being like, oh my God, but I'm scared. It's blah, 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 blah. Um, and even like I said, someone like me who goes through this kind of stuff all the time with my vagina health, um, I just had to check in with myself a couple times just being like, no, I'm good. I'm okay. I have a support system. I've got a great doctor. I feel really confident with them um, and I feel taken care of. So I think that's really important to consider when you are talking about this kind of stuff with a medical professional. (sighs) Okay, everyone, let's take a deep breath after talking about all that pussy stuff. (sighs) That was nice. Let's do one more. Walter's looking at me like, what the fuck is going on? Okay, let's answer some questions from you guys. I want to only answer a couple, A, because it's already been 40 minutes, but B, because I want to save some of these to do an all fan question episode. Um, Because I think that would be really fun to get like maybe some of your fave creators to help me answer questions from you guys like we used to do on adult shit. So let's go first with Katie in Nottingham. She says, hi, Kelsey. I recently just watched all of your adult shit podcast episodes on YouTube as well as your new podcast. I love them both. They're great. Thank you, Katie. Anyway, I don't know if you're planning on answering the kind of fan questions you and Kate answered on adult shit. So don't feel like you have to answer this question. Thank you, Katie. I will still answer it. Anyways, what is it you enjoy about giving blowjobs? I seem to remember you saying this on adult shit. I tried twice to give my friend, fuck buddy, hookup, we haven't talked about it, a blowjob for the first time, which also happened to be my first ever attempt, and I couldn't do it. I feel like I was going to choke, and I was afraid that my teeth were going to hurt him. Any suggestions on how to avoid this next time? Great question. Okay. The way I'm going to answer this question is that it's going to sound bad at first, but then it gets good. I promise. So when I first started hooking up with people, I was really afraid of sex and intercourse and penises going inside of my body. So I was like, if I learn how to do this other superpower thing, then I won't have to do all the other stuff, which is an awful way to think about intimacy. Again, I was very young when I started being intimate with people. I mean, like, let alone sex. I was very uh, open very early. Um, So again, like I was very young. I didn't know my body. I didn't know my boundaries. I didn't really know that I even had the Uh, power and confidence to be in control of a sexual situation. So for me, the way that I got into blowjobs is not like a happy fairy tale where I was like, I just love them. It was like, how do I do this so I don't have to do other stuff? Hear me out. I started, I hate saying like, I started getting really good at blowjobs, but I started getting really good at blowjobs because it became the thing, like my go-to move. And listen, when you're in high school, it wasn't necessarily a bad thing to be known for giving good head. I mean, I wasn't like passing it out like free candy, but it was like, I started to see it as like a moment where I could shine. Like it kind of felt like a solo, you know, like if you were to play like a flute solo in a jazz band, this was my motherfucking moment. Okay. So it went from a thing of like, I just want to get this over with to, Oh, look at me go bitch. Let me tell you another thing. Men are completely fucking powerless and super vulnerable when they're getting (laughs) blowjobs. Now there are some exceptions, of course, like there are some like sort of more kink based things where they like to be in control and, you know, choking and gagging and blah, blah, blah. Like, I'm not talking about that. Most men who don't have that sort of power just really turn into like a stick of melty butter when you give a blowjob. And there was something really empowering about that. Like there was something really empowering about me being like, watch me like freaking play this kid like a fit not kid man grown man of a consenting age <laughs> watch me play him like a fucking fiddle um so like again as I got older and I had more partners I sort of realized like this was a very empowering thing but that didn't 
take away the fact, like Samantha on Sex and the City says, it's called a job for a reason. It didn't take away the fact that it still like hurt my jaw and like required a lot of hand and eye coordination. And, you know, it, it can get exhausting. Like if you your lips are chapped or you haven't, you're dehydrated, like shit can get sticky and rough. And I totally hear you on the teeth thing, Katie. Like, I think that's everyone's fear. But I I have learned how to be more vocal during sexual interactions and I would encourage you the sooner and the younger the better. Um, I noticed like in this question you say, you know, we haven't figured out what we are. Are we friends? Are we friends with benefits? Yada, yada, yada. It sounds like you could work a little bit on your communication skills so that when you're working on this with your fuck buddy slash boyfriend slash whatever he is or they are, uh, you can also have that power in talking about like sex stuff. Like if I, if I, my teeth graze up against a dick, I don't like stop and say like, Oh my God, I'll kind of just be like, Whoops, huh, and like, you know, look at them and like laugh or something or giggle. Like the more we laugh during sex and the sooner you laugh during sex and realize that sex is fucking funny. It's weird and bumpy and not smooth and like porn, the better. So I would also encourage you to not be afraid of messing up and to take it slow. Most people with penises have a lot of sensation in the top, like the head of the dick. So you don't really have to go super fucking you know, deep throaty to, uh, let someone enjoy that moment. I'm a big fan of hands. So a lot of people don't realize that when you use two hands, you only have to have just like a little space for the mouth. And so if you could watch some videos, not too over-sexualized, more like, I don't know, maybe some amateur porn and, and watch some like hand job, blow job combos, that is always really fun for me. Um, yeah. And so like to, to, to wrap up this question slash answer, I think it's really just about like now for me, I enjoy um, giving, right? Like that's also just like my love language. That's also like my sign. I'm very like powerful, like a lion raw. I like being in control. And so for me, it's the emotional act of it more so than the physical because of course like my jaw hurts sometimes and that's when the hand the hands come in so um yeah I hope you find some pleasure in it and if you don't don't fucking do it okay like we aren't living in the archaic days anymore where like it's a requirement to be in a relationship. So just remember that, like do what you're comfortable with. But I understand the feeling of like wanting to be uh, like a perfectionist at something because that's definitely how I am. So good luck on your journey. Please keep me updated. Those are my favorite kind of emails to read is <laughs> blowjob updates. Okay, let's answer one more question so that I can post this podcast so it's not too late since it's already a day late. Uh, this one's from Grace. Grace says, I'm 19 and have already decided I don't want biological children. I'm open to adopting in the future. When did you know you didn't want children? How did you tell your family? Did it affect your dating relationship? I don't know how and when to bring it up with a significant other. I know it can be a big deal breaker for people. Thanks, Grace. What a great question, Grace. Thank you for listening. Thank you for writing in. Um, this one's loaded only because I think it's such a personal decision. So I don't want anything that I say to affect anyone negatively or positively or think that I'm like shaming people that do decide to have kids or, you know, cheering on people that don't want to have kids or saying that like, you know, you might change your motherfucking mind. I have said this before that I've always been someone who didn't want to have biological children either. And then I met Jared and he made me believe that I could. And I don't mean that in like, I needed a man's validation, but like having a kid is a big fucking deal. It's like a lot of work in case you haven't heard. Uh, so for me, it was like, it's not like I didn't believe in myself that I could do it. It was more so that having him say like, this is something you would be great at. And I think it would be like a fun adventure for you. And it, just having me look at it from a different perspective. Like 
he knows I like adventure and he knows that I'm very dedicated and perfectionist. And he, you know, instead of being like kids would ruin my life, that he helped me see it in a way that was like thinking of it in a joyful way. So I understand you're 19 and I have felt this way since I was like 14, 15. But now that I'm 30 next year, I'm glad I didn't do anything permanent. You know, I have known women that have pelvic floor issues that were just like, fuck it. I want a hysterectomy. And then later on in life, we're like, man, it would have been cool to just know like what my kid would have looked like. So I would say don't make any permanent decisions now. Uh, I feel like I've always known just because I haven't really ever had a connection to the idea of motherhood. Um, I have a great connection with babies. Like I like watching them and playing with them and then giving them back to their owners like a puppy. Uh, But, you know, my mother was not your traditional mom. She was not like a soccer mom. She wasn't ready for me when I came home every day. She didn't like go to PTA meetings. I didn't have the typical idea of like what motherhood is projected as. And I think that part of that upbringing could have maybe potentially affected my decision making when it comes to something like that only because I think if I would have seen motherhood as like this loving nurturing like really like badass connection with a tiny human maybe I would feel differently but I feel like because I grew up thinking like career first self first uh, those are really the only two things <laughs> or no, I should say like service and altruism. Um, it just wasn't a priority. Uh, how did I tell my family? I just always said it, you know, like I would say it as a joke. I would say it like, uh, whenever we would talk about like relationships, you know, if I'm talking with my mom, Um, they don't care. They want me to be happy. I also have a sister. And so if they really wanted grandkids, they can go bother her. Um, did it affect your dating relationship? I will say there have, let me say this. I would rather know if we're not going to be a match date number one. Like if that is really a deal breaker for someone, I'm going to tell you the same way I would hope they would have respect for me and telling me things and not wasting my motherfucking time or money. That may sound brash, but I'm like, that is a huge deal. It really is. Uh, you can act like, but we love each other. We'll figure it out. No, bitch, because then down the line, you're going to be pissed. You spent all this fucking time with the dude that wants kids and you don't. And then, you know, or with a per- partner that wants kids and you don't. And then you're like, why did I waste my time here? Um, and I do feel like it can't be time wasted. Some people will be like, it's better to have loved and lost than not loved at all. And I'm like, no, bitch, time is precious. YOLO. Figure that shit out early. If you have a partner, I would start talking about it now. And you say, I don't know when to bring it up with significant other. I don't know if you have a significant other now, or if you're thinking about getting one or like, you know, you're in line for one. Um, but to me, it was always something I said outright. Hi, I'm bisexual and I don't want kids. My name is Kelsey. <laughs> like, I think if it's a big part of your identity, then you should be quite upfront about it. If it's something you're not sure about, or like, I love that you said you're up to adopting in the future. That is something I'm really passionate about too. Um, It's just the idea of like my own, again, it's not like I'm like, I don't want kids. It's just like, I don't have that connection to the idea of it. Will my mind be changed? I don't know. I could like almost get hit by a car tomorrow and be like, all I want to do is procreate and leave a legacy. Maybe, but I feel like my legacy and my work and my altruism is done through this, through here with you guys, with the fans. Um, I think of you all as my little children (laughs) or my little sisters, I should say, and my older sisters. Like I really do have so much joy doing this and I feel like maybe that's how I should wrap this up is just with complimenting you guys your constant support and never-ending love even when I disappear from Instagram sometimes or if I'm posting a day late um you're the people I think of every day isn't that fucking weird I think about you guys all the time I may not respond to every message I get And not because I don't want to, but mostly because the Instagram DM feature is fucked up and it's very hard to like move messages from 
other requests to to primary inbox or general inbox. It's a whole ass thing, but I read most of them, okay? I'm checking Instagram multiple times a day. You can always write to me. You can always reach us at Confidently Pod. You can also email us at Confidently Insecure Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, and if you want to do a fan-related episode question and answer, uh, that's where you should put your questions. And I also feel like we should be doing a giveaway soon. Um, let's do one now. Okay. My acting scene partner was, uh, Nick. I don't know how to say his last name, but Nick V from the bachelor. He was the bachelor. I think, I don't know. I don't watch the show, but he has an essential oils company and a line. And he brought me some when we were doing our acting scene the other day. So let's do a giveaway right here for his release essential oils, which has peppermint oil, clary sage oil, lavender, grapefruit oil. It's also organic. It promotes calm and soothes nerves. And it's also USDA organic. He was really like adamant about me mentioning that. (laughs) So let's say if you put this episode on your Instagram story or Twitter, you are automatically entered and we will give you a week to post about it. So by next Thursday slash Friday, uh, market this episode, bitch, because you love me and I love you guys and you'll be entered to win this. Don't forget to tag Confidently Pod and Kelsey Dara in your Instagram story to enter. Don't forget to rate this on iTunes five stars. Anything less, please don't because I'm very sensitive and I can't handle it. And I will see you guys next week. I love you. Bye.